Welcome to Trench Diaries. This is Battleship Bismarck, Part 8. At the beginning of the war, for which the Navy was not prepared, the inferiority of the German fleet in relation to the British was incredible. The ratio was around 1 in 10. All we had ready for immediate deployment in the Atlantic were two pocket battleships, the Deutschland, soon renamed Lützow, and the Admiral Graf Spee. Also 26 U-boats and that small number of ships could not be expected to have a decisive effect on the war. The commander-in-chief of the Kriegsmarine, Großadmiral Erich Räder, who was taken completely by surprise by the outbreak of war with Great Britain, commented, Our surface forces are still so inferior to the British in numbers and strength that, should they become fully committed, the only thing they could show is that they know how to die gallantly. At least initially, the only naval bases Germany had at her disposal were in the southeast corner of the North Sea, as had been the case in the First World War. Whereas, thanks to their geographical position and the worldwide bases, the British could control every important sea lane and impede the passage of German warships to and from the Atlantic. However, when Germany occupied Norway and France in 1940, the Seekriegsleitung had advanced bases to the north and west, which made it easier to deploy our surface forces and U-boats on the oceans. The Kriegsmarine is to carry out commerce warfare and it will be aimed primarily against England. Overnight, this statement, contained in Directive No. 1 for the conduct of the war of August 31, 1939, became the basis of the Seekriegsleitung's strategic objectives. The weakness of her fleet obliged Germany to confine herself to conducting economic warfare and to design an appropriate strategy. The Seekriegsleitung was convinced that, by cutting Britain off from her Atlantic supply lines, Germany could win the war, providing all resources were concentrated on this objective. To Reda, all resources meant all naval resources, which in turn meant that our long-range heavy surface unit, battleships and pocket battleships, were to conduct commerce warfare on the high seas. This strategy was intended not only to disrupt Britain's trade, but to tie down her forces and keep them from concentrating. When German commerce raiders appeared in a certain ocean, Britain would have to move naval forces there, thus leaving other areas open. In this way, it was hoped, other German operations, such as a ship's breakout into the Atlantic or its return to port, would be facilitated. This offensive reached its high point in the first quarter of 1941. Between January and March, the battleships Scharnhorst and Gneisenau under Fleet Commander Admiral Günther Lütjens spent eight weeks operating against British commerce in the Atlantic. The total of shipping sunk was relatively low, 122,000 gross register tons, but the mere presence of German battleships in the Atlantic had forced the British Admiralty to take inconvenient countermeasures. It had to deploy significant forces in the ocean areas menaced by the Scharnhorst and Gneisenau and in the northern passages into the Atlantic and the whole convoy system was thrown into disarray because now every convoy had to be escorted by at least one battleship. The Seekriegsleitung responded with a plan to form a four battleship task force, the Bismarck, Tirpitz, Scharnhorst and Gneisenau and send it into the Atlantic to prey on convoys. Although the intention was to send this force out as soon as possible, it turned out that the Tirpitz, commissioned on February the 25th, could not be operational until the late fall and in the meantime the Seekriegsleitung would have to be content with Bismarck, Scharnhorst and Gneisenau. No wonder it was anxious for the powerful Bismarck to be operationally ready. The expectation with which Bismarck was awaited was matched by the corresponding anxiety on the British side. To the Admiralty it was clear that, when the German commerce raiders in the Atlantic were joined by Bismarck, the situation could only get worse. Therefore, it watched Bismarck's progress towards operational readiness very closely and apprehensively. It was reported, at one point, that Bismarck in company with light forces had passed Skagen on a northwesterly course on April the 18th of 1941. That day Bismarck was still training in the Gulf of Danzig. British interest in Bismarck went back further than that, however. Since the beginning of the war, Winston Churchill, first as First Lord of the Admiralty and after May 1940 as Prime Minister, had repeatedly pointed out the danger inherent in the German fleet being reinforced by the addition of Bismarck and had taken part in discussions as to how this danger could best be countered. In February of 1941, with Bismarck still not being operational, he tried to foresee what the Seekriegsleitung would do. He reasoned that it would not make a move until the Bismarck and Tirpitz had been completed and up to that point he guessed Berlin's intentions correctly. 
It seemed to him that Germany could not make better use of these great ships than to keep them in the Baltic and, every now and again, start a rumor that they were about to depart for the Atlantic. This would compel Great Britain to keep a powerful force at Scapa Flow, the home fleet's main base, to the detriment of other missions. It would also give Germany the advantage of being able to select her own timing for any operation, she would not have to keep her ships in constant readiness. And since the British ships would naturally have to go into the yard from time to time, it would be very difficult for the Admiralty to maintain superiority over the German commerce raiders at all times. Two months later, Churchill coupled a reference to the serious damage that Scharnhorst and Gneisenau had done to British trade at the beginning of the year with the remark that the situation would shortly be made worse by the appearance of Bismarck. Several times since the war began, he had pointed out the necessity of mounting air attacks to delay the construction of Bismarck by at least three to four months and said that success in such a mission would be helpful to British fleet dispositions worldwide. In August of 1940, he wrote to the British Air Minister, even a few months delay in Bismarck will affect the whole balance of sea power to a serious degree. And in October, he wrote to the combined chiefs of staff, the greatest prize open to bomber command is the disabling of Bismarck and Tirpitz. However, these hopes about the fate of Bismarck were not to be fulfilled before she put to sea on her first operational cruise. The success of Gneisenau and Scharnhorst as commerce raiders naturally led the Seekriegsleitung to intensify its conduct of this form of warfare with heavy ships. On April 2nd of 1941, as Bismarck approached combat readiness, it issued an operational directive that read in part During the past winter the conduct of the war was fundamentally in accord with the directives of the Seekriegsleitung and closed with the first extended battleship operation in the open Atlantic. Besides achieving important tactical results, this battleship operation showed what important strategic effects a similar sortie could have. They would reach beyond the immediate area of operation to other theaters of war, the Mediterranean and the South Atlantic, and the goal of the war at sea command must be to maintain and increase these effects by repeating such operations as often as possible. We must not lose sight of the fact that the decisive objective in our struggle with England is to destroy her trade. This can be most effectively accomplished in the North Atlantic, where all her supply lines come together and where, even in the case of interruption in more distant seas, supplies can still get through on the direct route from North America. Gaining command of the sea in the North Atlantic is the best solution to this problem, but this is not possible with the forces that at this moment we can commit to this purpose, and given the constraint that we must preserve our numerically inferior forces. Nevertheless, we must strive for local and temporary command of the sea in this area and gradually, methodically and systematically extend it. During the first battleship operation in the Atlantic, the enemy was able always to deploy one battleship against our two on both of the main supply lines. However, it became clear that providing this defense of his convoy brought him to the limit of the possibilities open to him and the only way he can significantly strengthen his escort forces is by weakening positions important to him, like the Mediterranean and home waters, or by reducing convoy traffic. As soon as the two battleships of the Bismarck class are ready for deployment, we will be able to seek engagement with the forces escorting enemy convoys and, when they have been eliminated, destroy the convoy itself. As of now, we cannot follow that course, but it will soon be possible, as an intermediate step, for us to use the battleship Bismarck to distract the hostile escorting forces in order to enable the other units engaged to operate against the convoy itself. In the beginning, we will have the advantage of surprise because some of the ships involved will be making their first appearance and, based on his experience in the previous battleship operations, the enemy will assume that one battleship will be enough to defend a convoy. At the earliest possible date, which it is hoped will be during the new moon period of April, Bismarck and Prince Eugen, led by the fleet commander, are to be deployed as commerce raiders in the Atlantic. At a time that will depend on the completion of the repairs she is currently undergoing, Gneisenau will also be sent into the Atlantic. The lessons learned in the last battleship operation indicate that the Gneisenau should join up with the Bismarck group, but a diversionary sweep by the Gneisenau in the area between Cape Verde and the Azores may be planned before that happens. The heavy cruiser Prince Eugen is to spend most of her time operating tactically with Bismarck or with Bismarck and Gneisenau. 
In contrast to previous directives to the Gneisenau Scharnhorst Task Force, it is the mission of this task force to also attack escorted convoys. However, the objective of the battleship Bismarck should not be to defeat in an all-out engagement enemies of equal strength, but to tie them down in a delaying action while preserving her own combat capability as much as possible, so as to allow the other ships to get at the merchant vessels in the convoy. The primary mission of this operation also is the destruction of the enemy's merchant shipping. Enemy warships will be engaged only when that objective makes it necessary and it can be done without excessive risk. The operational area will be defined as the entire North Atlantic, north of the equator, with the exception of the territorial waters, three nautical mile limit, of neutral states. The group commands have operational control in their zones, the fleet commander has control at sea. The group commands mentioned in the above directive were Naval Group Command North in Wilhelmshaven and Naval Group Command West in Paris. Both commands, each of which was then headed by a General Admiral, were responsible for the conduct of operations in their geographically defined areas of authority. They were immediately subordinate to the Siegkriegsleitung in Berlin and the senior officers afloat were subordinate to them. This form of organization was adopted for several reasons, such as a headquarters ashore would have the best intelligence available, it would have much better communications than the senior officer afloat and its communication systems was less vulnerable. The fleet commander has control over all tactical matters and, obviously, in action. The directive had no sooner reached the fleet commander, Admiral Lütjens, than it was out of date. On April the 6th, the Gneisenau, then undergoing repairs in Brest, was hit by a British aerial torpedo and a few days later by four bombs. She would not be available for a long time. The task force was now reduced to Bismarck and the Prince Eugen. Nevertheless, Lütjens proceeded to issue orders for the overall operation and Group North and Group West did the same for their respective areas of authority. Group North was responsible until the task force entered the Atlantic, at which point Group West took over. In his order of April the 22nd, Lütjens gave the forthcoming operation the codename Rheinübung, Exercise Rhein, and set forth his strategy. Its main objectives were they were to take every precaution not to be detected and then the task force was to steam through the Great Belt, the North Sea and the Denmark Strait to the North Atlantic where it would attack convoys on the Halifax-England route. Subsequent missions would depend on what the situation was, but munitions and stores would be replenished at a port in Western France. Under Lütjens command were to be Bismarck and Prince Eugen, the U-boats operating along the North-South Atlantic routes after the end of May, the four U-boats on the Halifax Inland Convoy route, the scouts Gonsenheim and Kota Penang, two fleet supply ships and five tankers. For protection, Sperrbrecher 13 and Sperrbrecher 31 would precede the force on its way from Arcona to the Great Belt and the 5th minesweeping flotilla would escort it through the Skagerrak minefield. Thereafter, it would have a destroyer escort consisting of the Z23, Z24, Hans Lodi and Friedrich Eckholt. Independently operating forces such as reconnaissance planes and fighters were to, were to provide air cover as prescribed by Group North and Group West. Group North timed the task force's passage through the Great Belt so that it would transit the channel in the outer southern Christian Sand minefield around 2030 on the third day of the operation and enter Korsfjord near Bergen the following morning. After spending that day in the fjord, which would allow the Prince Eugen and the destroyers to refuel from a tanker, at nightfall the formation would depart through the northern exit of Hjeltefort and steam at high speed for a point 30 nautical miles west of Sonnefort. Thereafter, it would continue at its own discretion. Group North recommended that, weather permitting, the force should straight away enter the Atlantic through the narrow Iceland Faroe Passage, keeping far away from the coast of Iceland. Should that not be possible, it should wait in the Norwegian Sea for favorable weather and make use of the opportunity to fuel from the tanker Weissenburg, which would be in the area. Group West allowed the fleet commander a free hand in carrying out the mission in the area of operations, but stipulated that, although the Prince Eugen was to spend most of her time operating in tactical, com in tactical combination with Bismarck, she would be subject to being sent on special missions at the direction of Group West or at the discretion of the fleet commander. It stated that if the breakout into the Atlantic should be detected, the mission would remain the same, being shortened or broken off as necessary. Group West emphasized that the important thing was to preserve the combat readiness of the ships, 
Combat with enemy forces of equal strength should therefore be avoided. Contact with a single battleship covering a convoy was permissible only if it could be done without fully engaging her and if it gave the cruiser a chance to engage successfully the remaining escort or the convoy itself. If combat was unavoidable, it was to be conducted as forcefully as possible. Two points in the above directives require comment. One point is that the Seekriegsleitung's admonition that our forces strive gradually, methodically and systematically to establish command of the sea in the North Atlantic, even local and temporary, command, was, in view of our limited surface strength, unrealistic. Apparently, it was born of a certain euphoria in Berlin. The other point is that the brevity with which the directives treated the matter of a sortie being undetected might give the reader the impression that this aspect of an operation, though desirable, was almost incidental. Such was far from the truth, but the few lines devoted to it sufficed because it was axiomatic with German naval officers at the time that if they could get out into the Atlantic without being detected, the chances of their operations being successful were enormously improved. Indeed, concealment was their highest priority, at least until the first attack had been made on a convoy. For our side, the weaker side, surprise was half if not more of the battle. And it must be said that surprise in later phases of an operation was equally important. Once the position of a German commerce radar had been disclosed by a contact with the enemy, the radar might just as well make for remote areas of the high seas from which it could later emerge with renewed surprise. An undetected sortie was the first linked in this hoped-for chain of surprise and was recognized as a prerequisite to the success of our surface ships in the Atlantic. On the other hand, and this also should be noted, the Seekriegsleitung did not go so far as to make concealment a sine qua non of a sortie. If it had done this, every time a force was detected, its commander would have had to immediately break off or at least delay his operation. And this in turn would have meant aborting any serious threat to Great Britain from the very form of warfare upon which the Seekriegsleitung had just decided. There was no getting away from the fact that Germany had to live with the risk of her intentions being prematurely disclosed because Great Britain was strategically situated on the routes to the Atlantic. It was left to the force commanders to decide whether to proceed immediately or to turn back and try again later. On the morning of April the 25th, Bismarck received orders to depart Gotenhafen and company with Prince Eugen on the evening of the 28th. The 6th destroyer flotilla was to escort the task force. This order had hardly arrived on board when we were informed that our departure on Exercise Rhine would be postponed from 7 to 12 days because, as Prince Eugen was making her way to Kiel, a mine exploded near her and did her considerable damage. Lütjens spent April the 26th in Berlin conferring with Räder on Exercise Rhine. The mishap on Prince Eugen gave the two admirals an opportunity to go over once more the composition of our surface task forces in the Atlantic. Lütjens declared that if there was to be no change in the plan to send Bismarck and Prince Eugen out as a pair, either it should be done as soon as the latter was repaired or they should wait for the next new moon after the one just waning. But there were also valid reasons for awaiting the availability of Scharnhorst, which was still in the midst of an engine overhaul, if not for Turpitz, which was nearing completion as well. The appearance of all four would make the operation much more effective than it would be with a teaspoon deployment now. Lastly, if one of our new and powerful battleships were to appear now as a commerce raider, the enemy would have time to take countermeasures that would reduce the prospect of success when joint operations became possible. Nevertheless, it was deemed wiser to resume the Battle of the Atlantic as soon as possible. In plain language, Bismarck and Prince Eugen should not await reinforcement, they should go into action right away. And with this return to the original operational order, Lütjens came to agree fully and completely with the basic thinking of Räder. In Räder's opinion, any interruption in the battle against Great Britain's Atlantic commerce could only strengthen the enemy. Furthermore, in the northern latitudes the passing season was bringing ever shorter nights and every delay increased the difficulty of reaching the Atlantic under cover of darkness. But, he told Lütjens, deliberate, careful operations are indicated. It would be a mistake to risk a heavy engagement for limited and perhaps uncertain results. Our objective with Bismarck and later Turpitz must be continuous, sustained operations. Act boldly against convoys, keep heavy British escorts tied down but don't get into action unless it serves the primary mission and can be done without excessive risk. If battle becomes unavoidable, conduct it with full force, operate deliberately and carefully such were the conflicting demands laid upon the fleet commander. 
How often was Lutyens going to have the heavy responsibility of deciding when to forego an irretrievable tactical opportunity and when to take it? His mission was far from simple. After his meeting with Reda, Lutyens stopped briefly in the office of the future Rear Admiral Hans Voss, who was then assigned to the Oberkommando der Marine. Voss, he said, I'd like to make my farewells. I'll never come back. When Voss looked at him questioningly, he added, Given the superiority of the British, survival is improbable. And here we go with the aft direction report. In this episode, we learned a lot about German strategic deliberations on how to beat Great Britain in seaborne operations. As you know, a singular decisive engagement like it was intended in World War I simply was impossible because of British overall sea power. Instead, it was planned to deprive Britain of supplies via commerce warfare. One prong of this strategy were of course the U-boats, which you can learn about in Iron Coffins, one of the other series on this channel, and the other was using heavy surface combatants to harass and destroy convoys. This has been a point of contention online when talking about Bismarck. Many people claim that Bismarck was in fact designed as a commerce raider, which of course is untrue. Bismarck was from the beginning designed to combat other fast battleships of her time, especially the French uh, Dunkirk class ships. And um, now this isn't to say that Bismarck couldn't be used as a commerce raider. In fact, a ship of this design fares excellent in this role, just like for example a main battle tank is an excellent tool for crowd and riot control. Anyway, from a strategic standpoint, commerce raiding was probably the only viable way of fighting Britain on the seas and thus the correct decision. Lastly, a few words about Admiral Räder, which we have heard a lot about. Um, Räder himself was a fervent defender of heavy surface combatants and wanted to have many battleships built. The so-called Z-Plan, Plan Z, was his idea. Uh, those of you who play World of Warships know about the Friedrich der Große, a 63,000 ton battleship of the planned but never constructed H-39 class, designed to have 16 inch guns. As we know today, this was economically unfeasible and a focus on submarines would have been better. Räder resigned after his surface ships suffered a series of crippling defeats and made way for Karl Dönitz, who immediately switched to increased submarine production. Räder as a person was a high-ranking member of the National Socialist Party, but on the other hand, he is well known as being an honorable sailor and officer. He famously and personally discharged Reinhard Heydrich, one of the most infamous members of the SS and later chief of the secret police, from the Imperial German Navy in 1931 for conduct unbecoming an officer. What did Heydrich do? Well, he promised marriage to a woman, but called it off after meeting another woman, which would later become his wife. Heydrich broke off his initial relationship by just sending the announcement of his engagement by mail, and that was that. Said woman's father officially complained to the Navy, which in turn led to a disciplinary hearing, during which he acted, and I quote, extremely rude, arrogant, and with obvious insincerity. The sentence, in the end, was dishonorable discharge. At the time, in the German officer corps, making a marriage proposal and not going through with it or being insincere about it was considered honorless. So be careful who you propose to. And with this anecdote, we shall end this episode. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next one. Cheers.